Good morning. It's a, it's a great day to be here. I would like to start by addressing some of the pressing questions of the day, which is, where is Mark Newman? Joe already asked the question and answered, where is Dan Duncan? But most importantly, where is Seth Thatcher? <laughs> that is the question. So I have some, some answers here for you. The elders at Believer's Chapel regret to announce the following layoffs, Ooh. <laughs> which I will read in alphabetical order. Thatcher, Seth, that is all. <laughs> all right, now we got out of the way. Yes, nothing worked out the way we planned it, but this is working out the way the Lord planned it. So we apologize for that. These things happen. And as Joe was saying, today we're looking at Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 9. And uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Alan Angelis, not Angelis. For 15 years, I thought Joe would know my name, but my name is Alan Angelis, and I am here happily covering for Dan. So we're looking at Philippians chapter 6, chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse 6 through 9. And it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time together studying it. Let, let, let us pray. Yeah, that water was from last week. So in this life, <clears throat> there is always something to worry about. Every season of our lives introduces a whole new menu of things that will make a person anxious. Some of these things are very substantial. It may be our families, it may be the church, it may be our friends, it might be work. And some others may not seem as important, but they are nevertheless a source of worry and anxiety and fear for many of us. I remember <clears throat> when we were beginning the process of adoption of our youngest, or of little Oliver, that uh, Rebecca and I, we knew that Eli was getting ready to, to have a little sibling. And we didn't want him to grow up to be an only child. Not that there's anything wrong, but, but we wanted him to have a, 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 a sibling. And the problem, at least for me at that time, was that adoption is not cheap. There are many of you here that have adopted children, so you know that this is not an easy or cheap process. So at that time, I only had one income, I had a mortgage, I had two cars that were on their last leg, and then a bunch of other expenses that were coming down the pipe. And, and at that time, I was really not very confident that I was going to be able to pay for all that was coming to us. So it was a time for, of, of much anxiety and instability in my life. I was really worried about many things. So what does God have to say about worry? That's the question that we have to ask, not only for our worry and our anxiety, but for everything. What does God have to say about whatever? Well, the Lord Jesus spoke about anxiety in Matthew chapter 6, in verses 25 through 34. And in that particular passage, the Lord goes through a list of the most common sources of anxiety for humans, for people. And this includes our lives. We're concerned about our lives, about clothing, about food and drink, in the future. And it is incredible to me to see how these things were an issue 2,000 years ago and they continue to be an issue today. So here in Matthew, the Lord tells us, stop being worried. Trust in me and I will provide for your needs. The scripture says throughout the scripture, all the New Testament, do not fear for I am with you. Do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, and yet what do I do? Well, I, I fear, I worry. So here in Philippians, Paul gives us a similar message. Paul tells the Philippians, and to us, 
to not be anxious. He does not want them to worry about anything, especially for him. Instead, Paul wants them and us to focus on the Lord. He wants us to bring to the Lord all of our concerns, our doubts, and our troubles in prayer. So <clears throat> Paul tells them, if you follow my instruction, the peace of God will fill your minds and your hearts. Now, I am fully aware that when someone is in trouble, in this case you that are listening, if I tell you, oh, don't worry about it, it's very easy for me to say because I'm not carrying the load that you're carrying. I, I, I've been there. I've been on that side, receiving end of someone saying, oh, don't worry about it. What do you mean you don't worry about it? I have the world over my shoulders. But what we need to remember is that at the time that Paul was writing this letter to the Philippians, he was incarcerated in Rome. And he was not only incarcerated, he was also personally responsible for paying for his housing expenses. So he had to pay for his own rent while he is imprisoned. And all of this is happening while Paul is waiting for Caesar to decide whether Paul lived or died. So Paul had every reason to be anxious, and yet he was full of joy and peace. Paul says in verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Notice here how Paul begins this verse with an imperative, be anxious for nothing. So this is not a suggestion, this is a command, be anxious for nothing. Paul is giving us an order, he's giving the Philippians an order. He wants his readers to stop worrying. Why? Well, first of all, to be anxious is to be disobedient to God. Second, to be anxious is to be worried, is to be fearful and distressed. A person who worries fails to believe that God is sovereign. A person who worries puts into question the fact that God is in absolute control of everything. There is nothing that is outside his power or his providence. They put into question that God is reliable and that he will fulfill his promises. In other words, an anxious person fails to believe that God is able to provide for his or her needs. That is a problem. That is our problem. Anxiety, fear, paralyzes the individual. I've been there. I know how it feels. And maybe some of you have felt that too. Fear and worry and anxiety incapacitates those who suffer from it. Worry produces wrong thoughts in our minds and wrong, wrong feelings in our hearts. And these wrong thoughts and feelings eventually become evident in everything that we do. In every aspect of our lives, they become evident until they finally rob us of our joy. So this is why Paul is commanding us not to be anxious. He's not requesting. He is telling, do not do that. Now, of course, Paul is not telling us to be careless, but we need to remember to care or to be genuinely concerned about things is one thing, but to worry and to be afraid, it's a completely different thing. It's another thing. For example, all of us care deeply for our families, our children, our wives, our relatives, for our friends, for acquaintances. We care about their souls. We care about their walk with the Lord. We are concerned for their well-being, for their health, for their salvation, you name it. We're, we're concerned about many things for those who we hold dear. But we must not worry about all these things. We must not fear because we have to trust that God is indeed sovereign. And he has a plan for each and every one of us. And this plan will come to fruition no matter what. Now, I know it sounds cliche, but it is the truth. God does have a plan. And that plan will happen. And it will unfold exactly as he planned. There are no surprises. There is no plan B. There's no alternatives. Whatever God ordained, it will happen. So we need to trust and to rest in God's sovereign grace and mercy. That's what we need to rest on, on God's sovereign grace and mercy. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> Probably one of my greatest concerns at this time is the future of my children. But not only Eli and Oliver. 
I'm also concerned for those who are under my care in the youth, which is, which is where I serve. I worry about their future. That's what worries me. It keeps me up at night. It, it makes me uneasy to think what's going to happen. And the reason is this. It seems to me as if every day that passes, we're sinking deeper and deeper into darkness. Things that were unthinkable five or 10 years ago are now a horrific reality. I'm talking about the redefinition of marriage, the redefinition of family, the redefinition of gender, the redefinition of personhood. We cannot give an answer to where does, where, when does life begin. There are people that can generally, or, or, or they, they might not want to, or they can really not tell you what a woman is. So it seems like we're living in the theater of the absurd, and this worries me. What's going to happen to these children? I teach them the Bible to the best of my ability, but I cannot believe it for them. I cannot do that. I can study, I can present it, I can talk, and I can do that all the time, every day, but I cannot make them believe it. That has to be the Lord. So all I can do is to pray that the Lord will do that work, that the Lord will save them. My anxiety, of course, is not going to accomplish anything. God has to do that. So I need to put that in the hands of the Lord. I need to make that request and wait patiently for God to do that if he wills. Now, a good question here is, what do we do when we fall prey to anxiety? How do we deal with anxiety? Because those days are going to come if they're not here already. How do we deal with this problem? Well, Paul gives us the answer in the second half of verse 6. He says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So what Paul is telling us here is that the primary cure for fear, for anxiety, is prayer. There are three different words that Paul is going to describe, that Paul is going to use to describe the right kind of prayer. And these words are, of course, prayer. Supplication and thanksgiving. So let me explain how these three fit together. Prayer is the general word for making a request known to the Lord. It carries the idea of adoration or devotion or worship. So when we begin to feel anxiety creeping in, usually late at night, when, we are, when the lights are off and, and, and there's no more noise, there's no ruckus around, when, when these times of fear and worry begin, what we need to do is to immediately turn to the Lord and begin by worshiping Him. But why? Why do we begin with worship? Well, because God is greater than all, any of our problems. There is no problem too complicated that He cannot solve. There is nothing too expensive that He cannot provide. There is no miracle too difficult that He cannot perform. In fact, the Lord said in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Well, the answer to this rhetorical question is a resounding no. Nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. You are almighty. You are perfect. You are the creator. And therefore, you're worthy of all our praise and honor. So no, there's nothing too difficult for you. So then... That's why we begin with worship. And after worshiping the Lord, we must make our supplication. And supplication is the earnest sharing of our needs and problems. This is where we ask the Lord to provide what we lack. This is where we tell him what we need. And, 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 and in this part, there is, no, there is no place for apathy or for half-heartedness. You need to express exactly what you want. There's no like, well... I mean, I guess I could. Nothing. You need to just pour out your heart and let know God exactly what is it that you need. We must be very specific in our supplications as, so that we can see very easily when the Lord has answered our prayers. I know that there are some people that have a prayer journal where they document everything that they pray about so that later on, they go and back, read their prayer journal, and they see how God has been answering their prayers throughout the years, faithfully answering the prayers of his children. So we do this 
for our own benefit, not because we're keeping checks on the Lord, but because we can see how he provides for us and we in turn give him thanks and praise him for doing what we requested. We further worshiping God for, for what he does. And finally, we end our prayer with thanksgiving. Every prayer must be ended with our gratitude to the Lord. After all, we need to remember God is the sole provider of each and every one of the rich blessings that we receive every moment of our lives. So we must thank him and praise him for that. It is only natural when someone gives you something, we teach our children to say, thank you. So that's what we need to do with the Lord. It is only natural. So the Philippians and ourselves, we are to make our requests known to God, not because God is unaware, not because he doesn't know what we need, not because he needs to be informed, but because this is a way to acknowledge that we're totally dependent on God. There's nothing that takes God by surprise. There's nothing that God doesn't know. He knows what we need even before we do. We are acknowledging that we depend on him for everything, for everything. Now, the sad thing is that we are all forgetful and we are prone to pray about the big things, but we don't pray about the so-called little things until, of course, they become big enough that we now pray for those things. So <clears throat> Paul is telling us here that the believer is to be anxious for nothing but praying about everything. So pray about everything. That's what Paul wants us to do. And everything means everything. Every troubling situation, however small, we need to bring it to the Lord. Remember, talking to the Lord about everything that concerns us is the first step to have victory over anxiety and fear. So we need to talk to the Lord. Several months ago now, I was talking to, a, 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 to one of my classmates at seminary, and in the conversation, one of them mentioned that he prays for guidance and wisdom before he sits down to do his homework. And <clears throat> when he said that, I, I felt like a lightning rod fell on me, like somebody punched me in the throat real hard because, because I, don't, I didn't have that, that uh, custom. I didn't do that. I felt so ashamed and convicted because I had never considered praying before I sat down to do my homework. Then I started taking Hebrew, and then I became a prayer warrior. <laughs> so, but the Lord, the, in reality, what the Lord did is he used this brother to remind me that apart from him, there's really nothing that I can do. I need him every moment of every day, even for doing my homework, however simple it might be. God not only ordained the ways, he also ordained the means, and sometimes... The means to a blessing is through prayer. That's why we need to be in constant prayer. Now, back in Philippians, Paul begins verse 7 with the conjunction and, and the peace of God, indicating that what he is going to describe next is a direct result or is a consequence of thankful prayer. So he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Here, Paul is making three statements about the peace of God. He says first that this peace is divine. This is the peace that God possesses, and then he gives to his children. This divine peace leads to his children to be content in every situation like Paul. He is in prison. He is awaiting to be exonerated or executed, and yet he has peace. He has contentment. The second, it says that this peace surpasses all comprehension. The peace of God is something that is supernatural. It cannot be explained. Our knowledge is insufficient both to explain it or comprehend it. So by faith is that we know that the peace of God meets the needs of our hearts. That's how we know this. We know this by faith, like many other things. So when a believer prays, God may not change his circumstances, but he will surely change his heart. That's what we need. And finally, this peace will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So it is the peace of the Lord that will protect our minds and our hearts from the wrong thoughts and from the wrong feelings, which in turn will become worry and eventually in wrong living. 
the Lord is going to protect us from that. God himself is peace. All peace belongs to God alone. Therefore, God alone is the one who can give us peace. Peace is an inner quality of the soul. It is the result of casting our burdens on the Lord, and it makes us undisturbed and un, 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 unstressed. Now, Paul is telling us here, he's not telling us that we're going to be free of trials, as you, as you surely know. So we're not going to be free from trials, but what he's telling us is that this peace is all sufficient even during the most violent storms of life. Even in the midst of deep suffering, the peace of God is all sufficient. So no matter how our prayer is answered, if we take our concerns to God in prayer, he will give us abundant and supernatural peace. That's a promise. That's a promise that we have here. That's a promise that we must cling to. The prophet Daniel is probably the best example to illustrate this point. In Daniel chapter 6, we see that King Darius had banned all of his subjects from worshiping or praying to anyone that was not himself. And after Daniel learned about the ban on prayer, he went to his chamber, he opened the windows, as he always did. This is not an act of defiance. He's just following his routine. He opens the windows, he kneels, he prays, he made supplication and gave thanks to God. Again, like he always did. Then in verse 18, we see that as a result of Daniel's prayer, he had peace in the most difficult of the situations. Daniel was sent to the lions to be killed. But to everybody's surprise, of course, Daniel spends the night with the lions, sleeping like a baby. While King Darius was so anxious and worried about his decision concerning Daniel's life that he could not sleep at all. He could not wait until daylight so he could go see what happened with Daniel. <clears throat> Back in our text, Paul addresses our thought life with a new set of admonition. He tells the Philippians in verse 8 that the only way to live rightly is by focusing on what is right. He says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So this is a list of eight virtues that every Christian should treasure in their hearts and in their minds. However, the world our culture, they're going to tell us that this list of virtues is nothing but a compilation of ancient human wisdom. It's just a compilation of, of moral philosophies, and that none of this is distinctive of Christianity. Well, I am here to tell you unequivocally that the world and the culture are wrong. Let me explain. Whatever is true means something that corresponds to reality. It is something that is reliable. It is something that is faithful. It is the opposite of falsehood. That is what is true. So the Philippians and us, we need to be fixed upon whatever is real, whatever is genuine or authentic. That's what we, what we need to focus on. So you need to know this. You need to know this very well about the truth. Truth is not defined by the world. Truth is not defined by our culture or any man. Truth is defined by the word of God. Truth is defined by God himself. So whenever the Bible says something, for the little children that are here with me, whenever the Bible says something, it is real and it is absolutely true because God is the one who defines the truth. It comes from God. Now, whatever is honorable, the second point, honorable means, means that which is dignified. It's something that is above reproach. It's, it's something worthy of respect. Something that is right is something that conforms with God's standards. It is something that obeys the law of God. Pure refers to something that is wholesome, something that is not mixed or contaminated with moral impurities. That is something that, pure, that is pure. And lovely speaks of that which is attractive, it's pleasing, it's beautiful. Something of good repute 
This refers to something that is commendable by God or is highly regarded by God. Notice that I'm saying by God. It's something that is commendable or highly regarded by God, not men, God. Excellence means mental virtue, moral excellence, and worthy of praise, again, is something that is worthy of praise by God. We seek the praise of God, not the praise of men. If this is something that men can praise, we need to be doubtful. Because you know that the praise of men is empty. We are seeking the praise and the approval of the Lord. Paul concludes this verse with another imperative. In this case, it is a call for action. He says, dwell on these things. Meaning, think about these things. Saturate your mind with these things. Do these things that I just told you. Paul is not merely giving us information here. He wants us to do something with information. Let me show you how. Up to this point, I hope it is evident for you as it is for me that all these virtues are a description of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. Therefore, the Lord must be the focus of our lives. His word must be that which saturates our minds and guides our thinking. It must be the light that leads us through this dark world. Our worldview, the way we understand the world, must be shaped by the scriptures. That's why I was saying at the beginning, what does God have to say about this? We need to understand our reality and the world around us through the lens of scripture. So this means that you and I must regularly spend time reading and meditating upon the word of God. We must regularly come to listen to the word preached. There is eternal value in sitting here listening to the words of the person that preaches. We must regularly spend time in prayer. And as I say this, I do realize that reading the Bible and praying takes a lot of time, takes effort, and time is a precious commodity for all of us. Time is something that we, we value and we guard and we don't have a lot of it. But we must not forget that there is nothing more precious than our souls. And the only way to nourish the soul is with the written word of God. That's the reality. And speaking about precious souls, if you're a parent here, which I know that many of you are, or maybe preparing to be, or just became, if you're a parent, it is my duty here today to remind you that children are a gift from the Lord and that their souls have been entrusted to you. So those of us who are fathers are primarily responsible for teaching our families, both wives and children, of all these virtues I just showed you here, and we need to teach them how to dwell on them, especially in a world that is committed to distort and destroy everything that God holds dear. So teaching the scripture to our children is not only an act of obedience, it's also an act of deep love, not only for them, but for our God. So that's, if you have fallen off the wagon, you have not talked to your children about the scriptures, if you're not in a habit of reading and praying, and moms too, you need to start today. It is imperative that you do it. There is nothing you can do to change the past, but there is much that you can do today to change the future. So I encourage you to start. Start today. Don't worry about what you didn't do yesterday. Just do it today. Back in Philippians, Paul wants his readers to understand that the virtues he described in verse 8 must not only be considered, they must also be practiced. It needs to be done. So he says in verse 9, the things you have learned and received and heard and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So here Paul's, Paul gives the Philippians four ways to put into practice what he had previously taught. So the first thing is that he, he speaks about the things learned. And Paul is referring here to the, to the sound doctrine that he taught the Philippians when he was with them. So the doctrine that you learned from me, put it into practice. Then he speaks about the things received. He's talking about this letter, this epistle. Read it and do it. Then the third thing he speaks about is the things that, he, that they have heard. When Paul was in prison, 
there were several people that witnessed what, what Paul, how, how Paul was his, uh, living his life in the midst of this uncertainty, in the midst of this trial. So the witness that they brought back, the report that they brought back, it was a positive uh, uh, um, report that they brought back to the Philippians. He says, do these things, follow my example. And then the things that, they, that were seen, it means the direct contact that the Philippians had with Paul when he was in Philippi, when they saw him, how he behaved, how he acted, how he lived his life, and how he reacted to the problems that, that arose at the time. So whatever you saw me doing, do yourselves. Paul concludes this section by giving yet another command, another order when he says, practice these things. As I said, Paul had become a very visible example to the Philippians concerning how they should live their life in pursuit of holiness. In other words, Paul is saying, now go do in your lives what you saw me doing in mine. And if you do that, Paul says, the God of peace will be with you. So Paul was not simply offering a list of, of, of virtues, a to-do list, or, or, or just you know, information that needed to be you know, just read and forgotten. He was giving them something to meditate upon. Paul was exemplifying these virtues in his own life. This was not just do as I say. He was telling them, do as I do myself. Do as I have done. So the importance of a pure mind cannot be overestimated. In this day and age, it is so easy for anyone to become distracted. There are so many things competing for our attention our family, especially if you have little children, our work, our school, our friends, entertainment, sports, whether you are practicing them or your children are practicing them, social media, you name it, all sorts of distractions, all things that want us, want our eyes and our attention. And yet, it is our responsibility to make every effort to keep our minds undefiled and pure from the contamination that the world is throwing at us. An impure mind not only stuns spiritual growth, it is also contrary to what God wants for his children. And as we observe the changes in our culture, it becomes clearer and clearer that the battle of the Christian life is the battle of the mind. And the victory in this battle is the experience of God's peace. Prayer and purity of mind are the two keys to a life of peace. There can be no question to the fact that godly thoughts will produce godly living, and ungodly thoughts will produce ungodly living. We need sound doctrine, just as Paul told these, these Philippians. Sound doctrine will be reflected in every aspect of our lives. If we have the wrong doctrine, we will live the wrong life. There is no question about that. Our minds are like the neighbor's pool. It needs to be constantly scrubbed from the algae. It needs the, the, the vacuum to be uh, the dirt from the bottom vacuumed. It needs the, the leaves to be skimmed off the top, because if you don't, if you don't maintain it, if you're not constantly cleaning, that pool will become a nasty cesspool that brings pleasure to no one. I know that some of you have had that experience in the past, and you know what I'm talking about. A pool needs constant cleaning, just like our minds. So we must set our minds on the written word of God. We must focus our minds on the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're walking with the Lord, if we dwell upon what is holy, the peace of God and the God of peace will exercise their influence over our hearts. That is the promise that Paul is giving us here. At the beginning of the lesson, I was telling you about the anxiety I was feeling as we were beginning the adoption of our youngest. And I, I, I spent a lot of time, too much time, preoccupied about how to make this adoption happen. It, it was like nonstop. I, I couldn't do anything else but to think, how am I going to make this happen? Now, in retrospect, I can tell you that the reason why I was so anxious and worried about 
what would happen with the future at that time was because I was relying on my own strength and abilities to make this happen. And I had no strength and my abilities were severely limited. My inability to find an answer to my problems kept me from praying as I should. I was just trying to find a solution instead of turning to the Lord. So I was completely focused inward instead of being looking upward. And those wrong thoughts and those wrong feelings prevented me from remembering what I had heard many times from several different men, many of them sitting here today, that God is able to provide for each and every one of my needs. The good news is that our God is a gracious and merciful God, and through one of his children, which I'm not going to say his name, but Seth bashes him every week, through this person, <clears throat> my attention to, to, was, was refocused into the Lord. God showed me and my family that he is indeed sovereign and that there is really nothing too difficult for him. God provided for absolutely all of our needs. Everything that we needed, he provided. Everything, I am not lying. And he did it in ways that we could have never imagined. We did not ask for anything. God sent it all. This is something that we were talking to our children just the other day. I want to tell you real quick. <clears throat> we were, it was a Monday. It was about this time of the day. We were heading to the Splons for a barbecue. I don't remember why it was on a Monday, but it was on a Monday. And then <clears throat> we get a phone call, and they say, there's a baby that was born an hour ago in Corpus Christi. How quick can you get there? So on Monday, you know, it's trash day. We had cleaned the, 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 the refrigerator. There were dirty. Everything was dirty in the house. We were going to work on that, but, but we had something else to do. So we take off in a rush. And then when we come back to the house, we're expecting a stinky, smelly place, and it's okay. I mean, like, we just deal with it. We come home to a clean kitchen, all the, all the beds made, clean fridge, food in the fridge. Who did it? I don't know. But we're really thankful for that. We, I know that someone here, it, it was someone from the chapel. So it's just in, in, incredible small things that the Lord provided. So God provided for all of our needs. And this is what Matthew uh, chapter 6 says. The Lord said, stop worrying. Stop being worried about things. Do not fear. I am with you. Trust in me and I will provide for your needs. And here in the, Phil the Philippians, Paul is commanding them to focus on the Lord, to make their requests known to God and experience the peace and joy that only God can give. So if you're here without Christ, if you're listening, if you're watching, and you have not trust in him as your Lord and Savior, you do have very good reason to be anxious and to be restless. And the reason is because you are an enemy of God. You are under his wrath. And there is nothing that the world can offer you to bring you peace. Because peace and joy can only come from God. Peace and joy are part of the fruit of the spirit that Christ gave only to those who are his. And to make matters worse... There is nothing that you can do to reconcile with God. And he does not. He does not let sin go unpunished. But as I said, our God is a gracious and merciful God, and he does not take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Back in the Garden of, of, of Eden, just before Adam and Eve were escorted out in sin and shame out of the Garden, the Lord promised him that he would send the Savior who would rescue them from their sinful state. And that Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the God-man. Jesus Christ came to die as a ransom for many. He came to die for those who believe in him. He came to pay the eternal debt that you and I could never repay. He came to save us from the wrath of God. Christ's death at the cross has brought us life, eternal life. And the life that he gives, he gives it freely. And the only thing you need to do to receive this precious gift is to believe in him. There's nothing else you can do. Just believe. So come to him today and receive the forgiveness that you so desperately need so that you too may enjoy eternal peace and fellowship with the triune God of the universe. 
Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word and through the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask for your blessing and your guidance and your protection as we head back into the world that is hostile against you and everything you hold dear. We recognize, Father, that you and you alone can change the hearts of man. So we ask you that if there's anyone here, anyone listening through the stream that has not yet to, uh, uh, come to trust in Christ as the Lord and Savior, that you would make this the day of their salvation. We thank you, Father, for loving us. We thank you, Father, for your infinite mercy and grace. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face, face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up your con his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.